Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the North Carolina Museum of History Community Class Series. My name is Crystal Regan, and I'm Chief Education Officer here at the museum. Thank you so much for joining us for this, our sixth NC Community Class Program. We created this series with the goal of educating and engaging all citizens. This reoccurring educational series aims to explore the historical contributions of individuals and communities across our state and nation. We want to connect those histories to the issues that have and continue to impact these often underrepresented communities by examining them in a historical context. By bringing these historical figures, events, and issues to the forefront, we hope that the series will encourage learning, conversation, awareness, and understanding. We've designed the theme for this season to complement and set the stage for our American Indian Heritage Festival taking place this November. This fall, NC community class topics have focused on the original nations and peoples of the great state of North Carolina. Our September program on Henry Barry Lowry and the Lumbee featured three outstanding historians, Nancy Fields, Dr. Lawrence Locklear, and Dr. Melinda Maynard Lowry. Our October program on the Tuscarora War featured Dr. Arwen Smallwood and Dr. David LeVere. Both programs are now on the museum's YouTube channel for your viewing pleasure. Some important information and a couple of house rules before we start. Understanding and respecting the traumatic aspects of the history shared in this program, we must mention that we recognize the content of this presentation may be sensitive or triggering to some of our audience. Ms. Michelle Carr will be managing our chat, and we invite you to participate by commenting and asking your questions. Some of those questions we will get to during the program and some at the end of the presentation. We're asking that you make sure your comments and your questions are respectful and relevant. Ms. Carr will be sharing important information and important numbers and contact information throughout the evening in the chat and may answer some of your questions there. Please feel free to highlight this program on your social media accounts. If you're tweeting or posting about this presentation, please use the hashtag NC Community Class. Tonight's program is on the Eastern Band of Cherokee and the Carlisle Indian School. The philosophy of the past Federal American Indian boarding schools was to quote, kill the Indian, save the man, end quote. The Carlisle Indian Industrial School opened in 1879 in Pennsylvania and was the first government-run boarding school for Native Americans. During the facility's nearly 40 years of operation, roughly 8,000 Native American children from nearly every Indian nation in Alaskan village, including the Eastern Band of the Cherokee, attended Carlisle. Students were made to cut their hair, change their names, stop speaking their native languages, convert to Christianity, and endure harsh discipline, such as corporal punishment and solitary confinement. Carlisle closed in 1918, but its legacy and that of many boarding schools modeled after it continue to impact American Indian families to this day. For the government, the boarding schools offered a possible solution to the so-called Indian problem. And for the tens of thousands of American Indians who attended them, the time is largely remembered as one of abuse and the desecration of the culture. Yet, many powerful stories of triumph, resilience, and survival arose. In this program, two awesome scholars will discuss the history of the Carlisle Indian School and its personal connection to North Carolina. Now I'd like to introduce you to our speakers. Ms. Barbara Landis recently retired as the Carlisle Indian Industrial School Archives and Library Research Specialist for the Cumberland County Historical Society in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. She is currently a consultant for the Carlisle Indian School Digital Resource Center and travels with a grant funded team from Dickinson College using Native American communities whose descendant stories have been influenced by the students enrolled with the Carlisle experiment from 1879 to 18, 1918. Ms. Landis has traveled extensively lecturing and presenting Carlisle Indian School programming at universities, conferences, and American Indian culture centers. Ms. Marvel Welch, a member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, honors and respects the cultural and traditional values of her Cherokee people. 
Ms. Welch works with a wide variety of communities by serving as an advocate on child welfare issues, on numerous commissions and boards, and currently she serves on the North Carolina Indian Child Welfare Board and the North Carolina Child Protection Advisory Board and the North Carolina Safe Care Advisory Committee. We welcome both of these ladies to tonight's program and Ms. Barbara Landis, if you would take it from here. Thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm very grateful to the North Carolina Museum of History and to Michelle Carr and to uh, Crystal and especially to Marvell Welch for all the good work that you all are doing. Um, I'm going to do a PowerPoint program and give you kind of a brief history of the Carlisle Indian School with a focus on um, the Eastern Band Cherokee Nation uh, citizens who were at the school. And if I can find my slide. So as, as you know, the dates, the, the Carlisle Indian School was the first off-reservation, federally funded boarding school exclusively for Native Americans. And um, it was the model for a group of schools that were founded following the um, philosophy of its founder, Richard Henry Pratt. Um, and so before I say anything more, I just want to mention to anybody who might feel triggered by the um, very hard hitting and, and traumatic issues that we're gonna be talking about tonight. There is an organization, um, the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition that is dedicated to healing, um, to dealing with people who have themselves suffered this trauma or their descendants who you know, still suffer the residual effects of, of this trauma. So um, I would encourage anyone who wants to explore that to contact the boardingschoolhealing.org coalition. But this is a listing, a map that shows all of the boarding schools that NABS has uncovered. And um, the Carlisle School, as I mentioned, was the first. And so usually when I begin programs about Carlisle, um, I ask people to try to superimpose a map over this image of children who were posed at the Carlisle Indian School in 1892. And so if you do that, you'll know that there were Alaskan natives, Mission from California, Coeur d'Alene from Idaho, Anishinaabe from Minnesota and Michigan and Wisconsin. All of the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota language groups were represented in these spaces. Practically every federally recognized Indian tribe is included in this group of people who you see gathered here. And among these, and I'd like, I'm going to pretend like I'm over here to the east in North Carolina, although our faces are in the way on my screen. But among these were um, over 254 children who came from the Eastern Band Cherokee Nation, as well as several dozen uh, Oklahoma Cherokee who, you know, would have been part of those family groups originally before they were removed. Um, now, does everyone have this lineup of our um, of our panelists here on their screen like I do? Maybe some of the panelists can answer that because I'm it's kind of distracting from my slides. But this is the Cherokee boarding school that um, is located was located in Cherokee, North Carolina at the reservation at the agency. And it was founded by Quakers uh, as a boarding and day school in 1884. Then, then this school closed in 1954. There were a lot of similarities between that school and the Carlisle Indian School that you see over here in this image. Um, this is a group of staff gathered in front of the Carlisle School and these are staff at the Cherokee School. 
And um, the Carlisle School also was heavily influenced by Quakers. Pratt had um, spent a lot of time with Quakers when he was first developing his philosophy about Carlisle. And um, he continued to use them as teachers and as um, his supporters for his experiment. So um, this group from Cherokee that you see in this image around 1890. Some of these children could have been the first children who were sent to Carlisle from that school. In mid-December of 1893, 24 students from this Cherokee boarding school were transferred to the Carlisle Indian School. They were the very first from Cherokee, North Carolina to come to Carlisle. And among them is one child who's buried in the Carlisle Indian Cemetery. Also among them was one Catawba girl. And um, when we're talking about the population of Eastern Band Cherokee children at Carlisle, we need to recognize too that um, many of those children were Lumbee children. There were Lumbee kids who were sent to Carlisle and they were sent through the Eastern Van Cherokee Nation. So um, of these like 254 children and the small handful who came from the Cherokee school, um, we, we know the circumstances surrounding their coming to Carlisle from the articles that were written in the Carlisle Indian School newspapers. Unfortunately, in the um, digitization project, the, the Carlisle Indian School Digital Resource Center that Dickinson College has created by uploading all of the actual student folders from the National Archives for the Carlisle Indian School population, there are no applications for the Eastern Band Cherokee students. So we don't know a lot about the circumstances from which they came other than what shows up in, that, in those school newspapers. And the school newspapers are heavily propagandized to put a good slant on what was happening at Carlisle. But these are all uh, faces of children who came from North Carolina and um, they had all kinds of, all different experiences at Carlisle. So, as I mentioned, we can find out a little bit about how they came based on the records. And of course, the families hold the real stories of how these children came. But we also um, can talk a little bit about why they left. And I'm going to just go quickly through some of the statistics that I have about them. Um, there were two children who passed away at Carlisle. And one is buried in the cemetery, and one is buried um, on, at their was a, died as a consequence of their outing experience, and is, was buried on outing. Now the outing system was unique to Carlisle. Um, when children were enrolled at the school, they were typically enrolled for a period of three to five years, and during that time, they never went home. They had to stay at the school for that whole term. Some of them actually were re-enrolled, so some didn't go home for more than five years. And in the summertime, when you would expect to be sent home from boarding school, these children were sent out into non-native homes where they lived with white families and worked for these white families for a minimal wage, sometimes in some cases, they weren't paid at all, but you know, were possibly going to school with their non-native siblings. And, and so they were essentially working for their room and board while they were going to school. So they might have been enrolled on the books at Carlisle, but they weren't even physically there. Um, of this, these Eastern Cherokee kids who left, um, three of them were employed by the Indian school or by other agencies. Seven of them were expelled. Um, 10 of them failed to return from leave, which meant that they somehow were able to get home and didn't come back. And, and those are not considered the runaways. There were also 
uh, 45 who ran away. There were 26 children who were at the school when it closed in 1918, and they got transferred to other schools. They would have been sent to the Haskell School or Shalako or um, to the um, Riverside School, uh, the Sherman Indian School in Riverside, California. An interesting statistic about these Eastern Band Cherokee kids is 36 of them actually graduated. Now, when you go back to that image of that sea of children that I showed, um, you know, we know of a population of about 8,000 enrollees, only a little over 700 graduated, which was, you know, less than 8%. But among the Cherokees, 36 graduated. 23 were females and 12 were males. And that is a much higher population than a lot of the other nations. Some of the uh, guys joined the army or the Navy. Um, 32 of them were sent home due to illness, which is a very typical representation of statistic for Carlisle and many of the other boarding schools. You know, you had kids who had not been exposed to diseases who, you know, came into the uh, Carlisle Indian School um, facilities and were exposed to diseases that other children had been exposed to. And, and the rates of illness were very high. Uh, three of the boys were sent to the Ford factory in De Dearborn, Michigan on outing which was not unusual. There were uh, a lot of kids who were sent to the Ford factory. So I put all these statistics into a slide because I wanna make this available for anybody who wants to explore this information further. The Indian school was a um, academic and industrial training school. So, Students would learn reading, writing, arithmetic, literature for half a day. And then for the other half day, they would learn some kind of a trade. They would have learned, um, if they were males, uh, blacksmithing, tinsmithing, carpentry, masonry, carriage making. Um, here you see boys in the blacksmith shop. And girls would have learned the kind of typical domestic arts that girls would have been taught at the turn of the century, cooking, sewing, cleaning, childcare, laundry. And um, in this image, you can see these uh, kids are in the printing uh, program. They were learning printing skills. And clearly that was one of the skills that was co-ed. When children were um, first brought to the Carlisle Indian School, they would have been put in uniform. They would have um, been assigned to some kind of a military unit. Regimentation was the key and everyone was put into a unit, a battalion, a regiment, and there was a ranking system set up like any military school. I was really intrigued by this when I found this because I've never seen any reference like this before. This is one of the Carlisle students who um, graduated from the Indian school and he wrote a whole long um, travelogue in the Carlisle Arrow newspaper in December of 1907 that described his travel from the Indian school after he graduated um, all the way to um, Cherokee, North Carolina. And so this little travelogue narrative describes how long it took him by train to get to each different stop. And then when he finally um, got to the last train station at um, Whittier, North Carolina, then he had to travel um, by foot to the rest of, through the rest of the villages and towns to get to his home. And he had to cross the Okona Lufta River. And when he got to the river and it was the next day, late at night, he had to wait to get across the river. So he had to yell and yell and call for a canoe and the canoe took him across the river. 
And he describes that really beautifully in his trip to Cherokee, which I'm going to post online so it's available to people who might want to follow his trip. So he got all the way to Cherokee and then he came back to Carlisle because he found a job working in Hershey, Pennsylvania. So we all know Hershey and we all know Hershey's chocolate. That's where the chocolate factory is. The Hershey factory um, actually hired quite a few Carlisle Indian school boys in the summertime because they had a baseball team and those guys could really play baseball. So they were recruited to Hershey for outing in the summer. But this, this particular uh, graduate from Carlisle was able to buy a bread truck. And he had this traveling bread truck. He was a baker and trained as a baker at Carlisle. And he took that bread truck um, all around Hershey and made his living as a uh, baker in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Um, I was really blessed to know Shan Gosthorn, and I don't know if any of you know this, this name, and this is not a very clean picture of her, but she was an amazing photographer and artist who was herself Cherokee. And um, she also was a basket maker, learned basket making. And she um, incorporated photographs into her baskets and she created this legacy series of baskets. Um, this particular one is called Educational Genocide. And when I saw that on, online many, many years before I met Shan, it was just the most profound piece of art that I had ever seen. And the basket is in the shape of a coffin. And if you lift the lid in red, Inside are the names of all the Carlisle Indian School children. She had woven all the names. She had taken these sacred names from Carlisle and put them into this amazing piece of basketry. So then in uh, 2015, she came to Carlisle. She got some grant funding to um, create a whole series of baskets. And she came to Carlisle and she visited the cemetery and she put notes and tobacco ties on every single grave in that cemetery, including the grave of one of her relatives. Um, <clears throat> this is this slide shows the uh, biennial conferences that the Cumberland County Historical Society has been um, creating and developing and held since 2014. So there was one every two years after 2014. And for the most recent one in 2018, um, Shan Gosshorn baskets were on exhibit at Dickinson College. And you can see this uh, series of baskets that she created that include the before and after photos of children from the Carlisle Indian School. The um, Cumberland County Historical Society is hoping to um, pick up these conferences again they were rudely interrupted by the COVID virus, but um, they're hoping that they'll be able to do some kind of a programming uh, next October. And um, the tentative title that for the last conference was Generations Restoring Carlisle. So um, I'm gonna make this available and I am um, gonna stop sharing now and turn my screen over to Marvell Welch um, for her insights about this. Shio Nagata, Anishko Histi, Ashunale. My name is Marvel, and uh, I'm a member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. And uh, I always want to start my presentations off with uh, a little bit of uh, who I am and how we are connected to our future and also to our past.
We are the keepers of the past and makers of our tomorrows. The story behind this picture is uh, I have three children and uh, I have seven grandchildren and always whenever my daughters were pregnant I'd always talk to the babies, always. And so um, I would speak Cherokee to them and sing to them and uh, so my daughter went to the doctor and she called me and she was kind of, there was some kind of uh, urgency in her voice and I asked, I says, are you okay? Is the baby okay? And she says, well, mama, I'm getting ready to send you a picture. And this picture is exactly how I would place my hand on her stomach. So you tell me that we are not connected to the future. As uh, Michelle and uh, Miss Landis had mentioned earlier, uh, you know, we're going to be touching on some very traumatic events or some, uh, some history that is uh, the topics that I will be uh, sharing touch on the different kinds of historic grief and trauma and that of our past relations and have, that, that they have gone through. So please take care of yourself. One of the Cherokee words that we have is called tohi. Tohi meaning being balanced in all seven directions, and that's being Father Sky, Mother Earth, North, South, East, and West, West, but mostly right here in you. So you need to take care of yourself, and there would be no uh, harm if you feel like some of the information that is being shared, you know, if you want to log off, that is fine but we need for you to take care of yourself because this is not only grief and trauma just for who I am as a Cherokee woman. I think all cultures have shared or have historic grief and trauma within their history. Boarding schools. Where did it begin? Well, I'm going to take you back a little bit further than uh, 1879 and why, why were boarding schools even here? Why were they even developed? In 1492, this is what the landmass looked like of our United States. In 1776, and this is what it looks like today, the land masses that are, uh, that are called Indian Territory. And if you see that little dot right there where North Carolina is, that would be the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. Just keep in mind of all the maps that I have shown you and the question, the burning question, why boarding schools? A lot of people may have heard what we call the Trail of Tears. The Trail of Tears was we were forced to, uh, we were moved from our homelands to uh, Oklahoma Territory. And there are three different bands of Cherokees. The Eastern Band, the United Kadua Band, and the Cherokee Nation. But we are of one people. Of one tribe. The Carlisle Industrial School. Carlisle was opened in 1879. On a cold night in fall, 147 children, Indian children, got off a train. The youngest ones were at least six years old. They were met by military staff who cut their hair, changed their clothes, changed their names to Luther, Joseph, or Mary, and led them to military barracks. That's where they would now call home. Carlisle Indian School was not a place to be a child. Physical and sexual abuse was widespread and well-documented. 
The military gave the school such little money, children didn't always have medical care or food. During the summers, they were rented out as domestic servants or for farm labor. A letter from in 1952, it was to, to dear Mr. and Mrs. Seeley. Thank you very kindly for your donation of $10 for my little Indians. Yours is the first invitation that was ever extended to one of our papooses to come and spend the vacation somewhere. We have little boys and girls who have no one at all interested whether they live or die or come and go. I would send you a little boy of six years old or a little girl, whatever you prefer. These Indian children are very little trouble, especially the one I have in mind. If you really mean it, I will see that we get him ready. You may have him any time you desire. I am not making any inquiries about you because it takes a good person to make an offer as you did. Hmm. I want you to think about that later too. Carlisle is still an active military base. What is left of Carlisle Industrial, Indian Industrial School today is a cemetery of children who died at Carlisle, decorated, memorialized with tobacco ties, plastic flowers, and little toys. Left on the headstones of children who never came home. Then these so-called schools didn't mark their graves. And last summer in Canada, people started finding the bodies, the bodies of hundreds and then thousands of children. In response to this, the United States has launched an investigation in how many babies are buried in our soil. For most of the little ones who didn't survive these horrific places, we still haven't found their bodies. Any other school that killed its children would not be considered a success, but Carlisle was replicated. The Bureau of Indian Affairs opened 26 boarding schools and churches, churches opened hundreds more. Death didn't get, a, get in the way of Carlisle's mission because the mission wasn't education, it was genocide. The Carlisle was the brainchild of a white man named Richard Henry Pratt. He conceived the idea of ending boarding schools and began the first one in Carlisle, Pennsylvania in 1879. His goal was to kill the Indian to save the man. What ironic words. The Carlisle School was housed as a military base where the children were forced to live their lives in accordance with military drills. His idea was this. If you took Indian children and cut them off from their families, their culture, and their tribe, they wouldn't be Indian anymore. And if you did that to enough Indian children, there wouldn't be Indian people anymore. By the end of the 1800s, the U.S. wasn't done acquiring native land. Now remember, look at those pictures of the maps that I showed you at the beginning. It had just come up with a new way to do it. Instead of using war, this time it used coercion, ending kids as bargaining chips. In, in his own words, Pratt wrote, the children would be hostages of good behavior of their people. And it worked. While Indian children were held hostage in boarding schools, the U.S. seized more land, an area the size of Montana. At the time, the schools weren't talked about as a land grab or a tool of genocide. They were charity. To solicit donations, one Catholic mission wrote that Indian children were in grave danger and good Christians who came to rescue would not only save those children, but reap their own rewards with God. 
Pratt even talked about himself as a benevolent man. He was saving those children. Throughout history, the people harming Indians have been motivated by two things, money and religion. The greedy simply wanted what the Indian people have, but the religious believe they know what Indian people need better than Indians pe Indian people themselves. You might think that church and state couldn't work together, but when you study Indian history, you find they always do. It's almost as if they need each other. The money have the resources and power to get things done, and the religious help excuse unspeakable harm and genocide. Boarding school era was followed by another federal program called the Indian, Indian Adoption Project. The government paid the Child Welfare League of America, America to take Indian children and put them up for adoption by white families. It was found that those white families were using those kids for farm labor. The Indian Adoption Project fits into the era of federal policy when government was literally trying to terminate tribes and tribe without children doesn't have a future. Systemic racism? Hmm. Intent? Hmm. Another reason so many Indian, kid, Indian kids were missing, bias in the system? There were few documented allegations of child abuse, but neglect was rampant. It was premised largely on white supremacist thoughts that Indian parents, virtually by definition, were unfit to raise children. The Indian reservations, virtually by definition, or unfit environments for children to be raised in. Where a combination of white money and white religion determined what was best for Indian children. And that's how we got boarding schools. For generations, for generations, the attack on indigenous rights, Indian children have been the driving force of termination. As uh, Michelle, or, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a child advocate, and in my personal history here, I came from a, um, a product, my ancestors, my past relations, went to Carlisle Boarding School. And uh, I appreciate all the work that uh, the archivists have done to preserve some of the records that were there because I, I did find him and I did find his application for Carlisle Indian School. He was a very physical, sexually abusive person to my past relations. And as, as in the social science field, I wanted to understand that, understand what made him the way he was. My in my search to find the answers to this was at Carlisle because he did go to Carlisle for three years and then he came out and then he went back. And at the age of 16, he was put into the army. And it was, or the cavalry, I'm sorry, the cavalry. And he, culturally speaking, we as Cherokee people we honored our children and we honored the women. There was no domestic violence. And so in my search to find the reasons of why this happened, it came back being taken away and put into a place where he didn't want to be. And I have not found documentation about the abuse, but he was not the same person when he left left our homelands. There is so much information that I want to share today, but it, there's, it's, it's going to have to be another time. As I said earlier, I'm an advocate for child welfare, Indian child welfare, and in 1978, Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter, signed the Indian Child Welfare Act. 
ICWA was created the way we normally think about ch uh, changing federal laws through legislation. It took 10 years of research, congressional testimony, organization, and finally a vote. And that vote in a democracy is supposed to reflect the will of the people. Native babies are in demand. While the number of white babies being adopted have declined for decades, the number of native babies being adopted have gone up, even with Indian child welfare in place. So in 1978, with the passing of the Indian Child Welfare Act, the Native American parents gained the legal right to deny their children's placement in off-reservation schools. And this is what developed. It came from the boarding schools and the treatment prior for Indian Child Welfare Act to come in, into play in 1978 because of the history and the horrific events that happened to all of the Indian children, not just the Eastern Band, but all the Indian children that were placed into boarding schools. Currently, our tribe is still trying to, uh, to recover some of the remains of one young lady or one child. We want to bring her home. And they're still are, are in marked graves at Carlisle Indian School. And this past June, I went to Carlisle Indian School to, ha to hope to have a better understanding of why of the things that happen to not just our people, but all the Indian people that were even put there, or the Indian babies. And I, I could feel the grief, and I could feel the sorrow. And all the many pictures that I looked at of all the students, not one did I see one smiling are laughing. They were all sad and some still had tears in their eyes because they did not know uh, what they were doing. They were just being told what they were going to do and literally kill the Indian to kill their spirit to save the man. So like I said, there's so much more information that I'd like to share and I, I I still have a heavy heart when I even talk about my grandfather and it was just, you know, I'm overwhelmed in trying to understand, you know, what my mother and uh, other, other women went through because of that historic grief and trauma. And, uh, and like I said, you know, we want you to take care of yourself because, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg of what's happening. And like, like, like I said, in, you know, in June, there was a couple hundred bodies that were found. And now it's thousands of bodies that they have found of our children. And it was because of the boarding school. And Carlisle was the premier, that's what they developed off of, was Carlisle Indian School. So, and I'm going to leave it at that. Um, uh, my, my research is still going on because there's so much more information that I want to know and, and hope to understand and to come to a good place, to come to a tohi place uh, to evolve a future. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Crystal, and it's, it's been amazing. And thank you for this opportunity to share what little information I did share. Like I said, there was so much more I wanted to share. The, and, within and, time frame. And so. Ms. Marvel, you, you have time. Um, I, I know there were a few other slides. If, if, if you want to take time, we've got another 10 minutes before we wanted to move to question, question and answer. So if you'd like to do that, um, feel free to do so. Well, I'm, a, like, I'm an Indian child welfare person and I, I'm so passionate about taking care of taking care of or understanding, I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase that, understanding of what it means to be a Cherokee person. And I won't say that I am, I'm fully in, uh, engulfed in my culture and my traditions. I think I'm a, an everyday learner of what that is and what that means. And like I said, you know, we honored traditionally and culturally, we honored our children and our women. And uh, for me to understand uh, that past relation and the trauma of the events that happened, 
you know, it just didn't happen with Carlisle. It happened, you know, in the beginning of time, whenever they found a Cherokee or whenever they found Indian people here, uh, they did, we were less than, we weren't human, we weren't, we weren't individuals that could, we didn't know what was good, best for us. And I could go on and on and on, but at, by profession, I'm a child and family therapist and the, the people and the families that I worked with, I mean, historic grief and trauma, it goes back, it goes back way to the beginning of their time, not just their time, but their past relations time. And like I said, it, I, I would be going back and I would take, this would be a whole nother series and, yeah. and why we have boarding schools and why there were boarding schools. And, uh, and I've, I've, done, I've done the northern route of the Trail of Tears. I retraced that back in 2013 from uh, New Echota, Georgia, uh, through seven states, all the way to the Oklahoma Territory at Tahlequah. And we stopped at every spot that was significant or that was recorded. Uh, Daniel Buttrick was one of the missionaries that was on the Trail of Tears, and he, he said it best, you know, why didn't the government go ahead and put to death the infants and the people over 60? Because we, we lost thousands of my past relations because of the weather, the disease, and it, it, and it, it to me, I wanted to understand that, to understand what my past relations went through, and to under, try to understand that in, in a sense that where I can move forward. And that's what I, I'm wanting to do now is move forward, not just for me, but for my family, for my children, for my grandchildren, for the next seven generations, and in a good way in a good way to know that this is your past, you know, whether it be trauma, you know, we can work, we will never forget the trauma because it will always be with you, but, you know, work with it to evolve into a better person in, in a good way. And, oh, I feel like I'm rambling now, but, uh, but like I said, if there's any questions or comments, please, you know, yes. uh, we do. And, and thank you. Thank you, ladies, so much for those presentations. I just want to make sure, uh, uh, Ms. Marvel, that you are able to go through all the slides and, and, and have your time to, to present. But we can move right into um, the question and answer session uh, with you uh, and Ms. Barbara. So a few questions came through uh, the chat, and then there were some questions that we were provided um, earlier just to keep the conversation going. And, and one of the questions um, that came through was, could you talk a little bit more about um, sources? Where can, if people want to learn more um, about this event or, or this series or uh, time in our history, where, where are some really good places for independent scholars or even um, the descendants to go to learn more um, about these boarding schools? And that's for either one of you, whoever would like to, to start. Well, I will tell you, I got a lot of information for, from Ms. Landis's uh, documentation and the digital library uh, for the Carlisle Indian School. And, uh, but it doesn't take a lot because uh, we have a good genealogy program here that we have access to and records of the Cherokee boarding school. Uh, Ms. Landis uh, talked about the boarding school here in Cherokee. And it's just Google. Google your title words and it will throw it out at you. And uh, like I said, I have relied a lot of what uh, the Cumberland, uh, Cumberland uh, archivists have put into digital form. I would I would echo that. Um, I, I think, though, it's really important to recognize that these materials are heavily propagandized. You know, they are so slanted and 
I have found that the school newspapers, most of which have also been uploaded to the uh, Digital Resource Center, are a, a great font of information. Um, for years, I transcribed those newspapers and sent them out to, I think I had a list of 500 descendants who were receiving those newspapers every week. And they would find information about their relatives and kind of the day-to-day -day stories that would come out. Um, and because they were uh, transcribed, they were searchable. So that was a great source of information. So I would encourage people to go to the publications at the CISDRC. Uh, and the, the site is www.carlisleindian, all one word, dot Dickinson, dot edu okay. um, photographs are a, a rich source of information but like marvel said um you know they're very stoic and they um they don't there's no there's no light there's no happiness there's no joy in so many of those photos so it's very very difficult to um, process them and to, and to take them in. But, but they have a lot, you know, photos have a lot of information about how they're staged and, you know, how, um, how people are looking at each other. And, you know, there are some really great, more candid photographs, especially of sports. You know, Carlisle is where Jim Thorpe came from. And, you know, while we talk about all these stories of loss and trauma and hardship, um, there was a kind of a magical thing that happened at Carlisle with the sports teams and the sports stories. So, you know, that that is a whole different aspect of what happened at Carlisle. But um, the stories are held in the families. That's where the stories are. And that I think really needs to be recognized. The oral histories that come out of the families should be the, should hold the most weight when you're trying to piece together these stories. So if you know if you have access to those stories through your own friendships, that's the best way to uh, put together information about what happened. And some of the stories that I shared, you know, were just at Carlisle. They were at other boarding schools also. Right. Uh, uh, the initial find this past summer was a uh, boarding school in Canada for indigenous uh, for the indigenous population. So, uh, but boarding schools, I mean, they there was over three hundred fifty. I want to I want to say your number was like three seventy, Miss Landis. I but, think uh, it, it grows. It keeps growing. Yeah. Because people yeah. are making more and more discoveries. Yes, yes. And that's what's sad. And uh, like I said, I was in Carlisle in June. That's when they were uh, repatriating the remains of the Aleut young lady, a young girl, mm -hmm. baby. And, uh, and it was just, uh, it, was, it was almost going to hallowed ground, if you know what I mean by that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just to feel that this this baby was going to finish her spiritual journey because she was going home and um, and I, I felt I read the story about you know her sister that you know did go back home but you know her sister her other sister didn't go back home and uh, just to complete her journey her spiritual journey and and you know to go back to revitalize I think that was one of the things that they mentioned was that they were going to revitalize their language and their culture and their history that that kind of jolt them to, to, to bring her home. And um, the Dakota children that were returned, you know, it was sad. It was sad to watch it. It was sad. But you know who returned their remains to the earth? It was the children that returned them back to the earth. And, uh, and there was, there's so many stories out there. There were so many stories shared with me. And, and it's just like, you know, it's that historic grief and trauma that we need to recognize and to work with and work through so we can move forward. 
have time for just a couple of more questions. And one of them was, um, could we uh, talk a little bit about what attributed, uh, Ms. Barber, you talked about the graduation rates, if you will, mm -hmm. um, of these boarding schools. And you mentioned um, that among some nations, uh, the rates were higher than others. Mm -hmm. Is there any sort of, uh, what can you attribute to that? Or were there any specific set of uh, uh, circumstances that would uh, have led to those, quote, graduation rate results? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the Cherokee boarding school would be a factor in that because uh, children would have come to Carlisle already speaking English and uh, with knowledge of reading and writing. So um, they would have already had tools that other children wouldn't have had. There were children who came to Carlisle who did not speak English at all. You know? And so in United States policy after 1890 dictated that children had to have at least four years of previous schooling before they could be enrolled in an off boarding school. So then we started to see graduation rates climb. The very first graduating class at Carlisle was not until 1889, a full 10 years after the school opened. So that would be a factor. Okay. Um, just, you know, the, the mission schools were very pervasive in among the um, Anishinaabes, um, among the uh, Pueblos, the Catholics had, then the Jesuits had set up mission schools pretty early on. So those children likely had more training before they were sent to an off res school. That could be another factor. But I don't, I don't really know what the graduation rates were like in the entire population, let alone the American Indian uh, boarding school population. So you know, it could be that, that, you know, those rates would be comparable to uh, rates in the general population. Correct. Okay. Um, Want to touch on uh, one other question, and that is, could you talk a little bit more about the experiences of parents and, and, and when they were in a position to make decisions about releasing their, their babies into these schools? How much of a choice did they have? Um, wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that decision-making um, regarding um, young people being separated from their parents to, to go to these boarding schools and not see them for three to five years at the time. What went into that? What do we know about those family histories and stories that went into some of those decisions? From some of the information that I have gathered uh, mm -hmm. from some of the survivor, survivors, the relatives, was that uh, some of them didn't know that's where they went. Uh, some of them were just taken or stolen. Uh, it was almost like a bounty. You know, how many children can you get to, mm -hmm. to be put into a boarding school? And uh, in, in, our, in the Eastern Band's case was they had to have two people sign off uh, to go to be put at uh, Carlisle or any other boarding school, because they, we were, they were sent to other boarding schools also. Carlisle would just wasn't the only one. And uh, uh, the, usually the superintendent, the Bureau of Indian Affairs superintendent, usually had to sign off. And either the acting chief at that time, he would also sign off on it. Uh, when, I, when I retrieved the, the records of uh, my grandfather, uh, the, one of the chiefs signed for him to go. And like mm -hmm. I said, he went twice and there was a three year break. And I, I was wondering, well, what happened within that three years? And they took him back and he didn't come home. He went straight to the Calvary. Mm -hmm. And so what happened? Why? You know, a lot of questions. Why? And uh, but like I said, you know, they usually had to have the male or the father uh, sign off on it. And if it was the woman, which was very kind of uh, like the woman in our in our society is the say all. She's, you know, she's the, she's the one that makes these decisions and they would not accept the woman's signature. She had to have somebody else sign for her, uh, for her child. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
like I said, it was sometimes in different situations for different tribes. Some of them were stolen, some some were signed, uh, and some of them didn't know what they were signing uh, whenever their children were taken away. That's what I have found. Yes, ma'am. And at Carlisle, there were prisoners of war who had no say in sending their children. Um, the Chiricahua Patch and uh, Geronimo's band of people when Geronimo was finally brought in, um, his, all of the community that he was associated with, that nation and that band were sent to Florida to um, the prison in St. Augustine. And Pratt literally went and took those children from their mother's arms. So, you know, there were a lot of different circumstances Right. I, I do know that on the application, and I don't know, Marvel, if this will be on your grandpa's application, but there is a clause on some of those applications that says, no one has forced me to sign this form and no one has withheld rations from me. So that's kind of a clue about the tactics that were used. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Mm. Well, ladies, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I, I do want to give uh, one last uh, opportunity um, because I like to end with this question and that is, what do you want the audience? And we wanna thank everyone who's joined us tonight, but what do you want them to take away? I know Ms. Marvel, you talked about looking forward and, and the future, but if you could both just give a few words uh, regarding what it is you want people to take away from this information, this history, in terms of who we are as, as a nation, as a people, or as peoples. Um, what, are, what, are your, what is the takeaway? I want people to understand. I think uh, it's not just being Cherokee, whatever, whatever, whatever your culture and whatever your traditions are, whether it be German, Irish, uh, African-American, to know your history, to know how, why are things the way they are today? And we all make mistakes and what is it that we can learn from this and move forward in a better way and live in life in a better way and moving forward. And cause like I said, historic grief and trauma just does not go away. It, it doesn't, it, it needs to be, you need, I won't say face it, but you need to understand it. Um, it's just like, I want to understand. Uh, when I was on the trail, on the Trail of Tears, uh, I was sitting on top of the Pona, uh, um, Ozark Mountains or hills, they call it. And I sat there and I cried because I thought, it started rolling again, like the mountains. And I mm -hmm. thought, I wonder if my people thought they were going back home. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I says, I don't understand. I, I want to understand, you know, why this is happening. And so every, st every step that my past relations took, I was right there wanting to learn. And, and, and I'm, I'm an old woman, uh, but I think I learned something about being a Cherokee person every day. And, mm -hmm. uh, and to understand that, to understand who you are so you can evolve to something better in a good way. And that's what I want people to, you know, take away. And I can, I can trace my, my family back to 13 generations. And, wow. and when I do presentations for uh, students and I ask them, I says, can you give me three generations? And, and they struggle and that's mm -hmm. sad. And I would want people to know, you know, this is where I came and this is where I'm going. And this is, I am proud to be, I am proud to be Cherokee. Um, so, but I'll, the takeaway is understanding, understanding to move forward for the next seven generations. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I would certainly reiterate everything you said, and especially emphasize the phrase in a good way. Try to listen. I think it's um, when I first started doing this research 30 years ago and people would come to visit at the historical society where I worked and they just, they would not speak about what happened with their relatives. They would not talk about it. 
And that was probably two and a half, three generations ago. Now people are starting to talk about it. And I think that the most important thing that we can do is to learn to listen. Let those stories emerge and just listen. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to apologize. People really don't care about your guilt if you have it. Just listen. And that would be my advice. I certainly hope that makes Ms. Barbara Landis and Ms. Marvel Welch, thank you all so much, both of you, for, for gracing us tonight. Um, and I want to thank all of our viewers uh, who've joined us tonight. I want to remind everyone of our AIHC Festival, uh, American Indian um, Heritage Celebration that is coming up. We invite you to register, join us, and continue to learn more. We want to continue this dialogue. Um, and unfortunately, we're out of time, but we're certainly not out of content. Um, and we've just scratched the surface of some really important history and a complicated but very important topic. And again, I want to thank the panelists, and I want to thank Ms. Michelle Carr, my colleague, uh, Mr. Uh, Joel Rhodes, Ms. Stacy Smith, and Ms. Allison Bouley, who is orchestrating, organizing, and facilitating our American Indian um, Heritage Celebration. Um, so we want to ask that you stay tuned for our upcoming community class programs in the spring. We're going to continue to try to have these conversations to talk about uh, the contributions and the rich culture of all North Carolinians and, and people across our nation um, here at the museum. So thank you for joining us. We hope that you continue to look to the museum for your edutainment, your edu educational and uh, entertainment needs. Um, and stay safe, and we will see you at our next community class in the spring. Have a great night, everyone.